Welcome back to another episode of the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. Today I go solo and share with you my insights into my investigations behind the curtain of the United States Navy SEALs. So sit back and relax and enjoy this episode of the Two Dates in a Dash podcast. I am your host, Matt Kubler, and today I will be doing a solo show. Very rare. I don't do very many of those, um, but there's... I only do them when I know I have something to say <laughs> that I can withstand a, a lengthy period of time of talking about it. And many of you who follow the show and are, are fans of the show know that I have um, done a couple shows on uh, some high profile Navy SEAL stuff that I was brought into. Um, hey, James. Um, just for everybody, I'm doing this live. So, <laughs> and to all of you in podcast land that are listening to this later, um, I will engage with. Uh, people who comment or say hello. So anyways, I decided today something was on my heart that I needed to put out in the universe, I guess. So for me, um, that's kind of how when I do solos, it's usually because I have something that's on my heart that I need to share. And uh, today's one of those days. So for those of you that aren't, that don't remember, I believe episode 61, if I'm not mistaken, was an interview I did with Bronwyn Price. Um, I didn't. Oh, good Lord, Bronwyn DeMasso, who is the sister of Job Price. Job and I went to high school together. We graduated together. Um, he became um, a SEAL after graduating from the Air Force Academy, and then um, he transferred his commission to the Navy. By my account and everyone else's account that I've ever spoken to who knew him professionally in that environment, he was like the White Knight. He was the Boy Scout. He was the the ideal seal as far as leadership, uh, accountability, uh, honor, dignity, duty, all the things that you're looking for. Um, Job was always the most affable, um, kind of goofy kind of kid growing up. And he was that way as an adult, even after all the things he's seen and done as a seal, he still had that trait about him. Um, I was brought in uh, to investigate his death on behalf of the family. I would was given access to all of his his files, to the NCIS uh, investigative files, the Army CID files. And after a very um, in-depth investigation, um, speaking to many SEALs who were there, reading statements, um, understanding crime scene investigation and how that is typically done or should be typically done, I, I came to the realization that um, I came to two realizations. Number one, that um, based on the evidence that was available to, for me to look at, which I was told is the complete evidence package, there is no way any um, investigator or even the Navy themselves could have determined that Joe Price committed suicide. The evidence, the crime scene, um, the actions of SEALs and the NCIS agents were at best inept, bordering on corrupt, and in some cases, 100% corrupt. So you couldn't come to a conclusion that Job took his life based on the fact that evidence was missing, evidence was tampered with. Um, all the things that as a defense attorney you would use to um, try to get your client off, or as a prosecutor, you would want to have every I dotted, every T crossed. And you would think that for the high, at the time, I believe he was the highest ranking person to die in country during the Afghan and Iraq wars. That this was the very best that they could do is embarrassing for, for our country, for the Navy and for NCIS and the Navy SEALs. From that investigation, and after speaking to many people within the community, I believe that Job was murdered. That's my professional opinion. That's not based on emotions. It's based on my 28 years in law enforcement and understanding um, how uh, crimes can be manipulated or crime scenes can be manipulated and how criminal actions usually start with um, the guise or the ruse of ineptitude, especially when it's done from within and people who are involved in 
in the um, crime scene security, evidence, chain of, chain of custody, those kinds of things. It's usually they play it off as we messed up. I believe it was intentionally done, and I believe it was done to cover up a crime, the crime of murder. So from that investigation, it opened my eyes to want to look more, to look deeper, to understand how that could happen within the elite Navy SEAL uh, community. I began speaking with many members of active and former members of, of the Navy SEALs from every team there is, including SEAL Team 6. And I started to see, um, based on the things I was told, and mind you, I, I have to preface this with, I'm not, I'm not condemning the Navy SEALs. I believe they are, are amazing. Um, I believe what they do is important. I believe the fact that the silent professional is what they should be, the, 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 the bar they should be achieving is to be the silent professional, not the, the bragging brand builders. Um, and I want the Navy SEAL name and their reputation restored back to its greatness. That's my only goal. Um, <clears throat> but when you hear these stories, and, and mind you, I have to also tell you that most of these people are talking to me off the record, and they won't talk on the record, and we'll talk about why that is and why we are we are still in this cycle of corruption within the SEALs is simply because no one will come forward and speak their truth in an open public forum and, and preferably on the record and under oath. But um, hopefully we'll get to that one day. But after speaking to all these, these members of the SEAL community, both Navy SEALs, people who work in support, that work hand in hand with the SEALs on a daily basis, um, I found patterns of corruption. And it wasn't just one team. It wasn't just one group. It was pervasive throughout all 10 teams for the most part. Not necessarily every member of the team, but there was corruption within each of the teams at a certain point in time over the last, we'll call it 20 years. I also did an episode um, regarding an incident called known as Roberts Ridge. Um, if you just Google Roberts Ridge, you'll you'll read a lot on that. Um, Lori Chapman Longfritz, who is uh, the sister of John Chapman, who was an Air Force um, combat controller who was at the time in 2002 um, in Afghanistan attached to SEAL Team 6. And the long short story of this is that Neil Roberts, they were doing a uh, very risky pre-dawn, like 4 a.m., um, insertion onto a mountain in, uh, in Afghanistan and, um, the helicopter received uh, rocket fire against it. Uh, Neil Roberts, who had unclipped to, de de to de disembark the, the helicopter, um, fell out of the back of the helicopter when it got hit by the rocket, uh, onto the mountain. What happened next was the attempt to try to save Neil Roberts. The helicopter ended up doing a, a, a circle around and trying another insertion in order to get get to Neil um, and got hit again with more rocket fire, did a crash landing, and the team exited the, the helicopter. And for the first 15 years after 2002, that was on March 4th, 2002, um, for 15 years after that, the story went as such that Brit Slabinski, who was the team leader on SEAL Team 6 for their for that team, I forget if it was red or blue team, I think it was red, um, which was commanded, SEAL Team 6 was commanded by a gentleman named Tim Szymanski. Um, <clears throat> the story went that Brit Slabinski heroically um, tried to save Neil Roberts and at the same time tried to save um, John Chapman, who was shot and killed on the mountain. And uh, for 15 years, that was the story. And the story sort of morphed over those 15 years as it, information started to leak out that maybe that wasn't the most factual accounts of that that, that, that dreadful day. Um, 
what ended up actually happening was that the Air Force Combat Controller, John Chapman, he was the one who stormed the mountain, killed the enemy, tried to save Neil Roberts. Rich Slabinski and the rest of the team were behind him. They came up in support. At some point in time, Neil, uh, Neil was dead and John Chapman was rendered unconscious. They were getting shot at from all different kinds of angles. And, and I want to also stop here and say that I am not questioning anyone's heroism or actions that day as far as how did they fight um, and the, the bravery it takes to go into a gunfight. I'm well aware of that. What I'm, what I'm pointing out and highlighting is when you lie and you do it intentionally in order to cover up um, a crime or, or a misdeed or a mistake or whatever you want to call it, that's what I have a problem with. I'm a very big proponent of own your shit. I try to own my shit every day. And, and when people don't, and then they collude to create a narrative and then perpetuate that narrative over a period of 15 years, I have a really big problem with that. So what happened was John Chapman was the hero. He was rendered unconscious. Brits Lubinsky and the rest of the team decided that it was too many angles, too many people, too much, too much danger. Um, in that gunfight, and they came off the side of the mountain, leaving Neil Roberts and John Chapman up on the mountain. What they didn't do was check to see if John Chapman was alive. Because if they had, they would have realized he was. And they wouldn't have found out that about an hour later that John Chapman awoke from his being unconscious and then fought for about another hour, killing more Al-Qaeda and actually saving lives from a QRF team, a quick reaction force team that was coming in to rescue the SEALs. Um, there were 23 on board there, um, 18 lived, I believe was the number. Um, and that John Chapman's heroism and drawing fire to him and away from the QRF um, was actually what happened. But none of this became aware. Ooh, there goes my alarm. Um, none of us, none of this became aware to anyone until word came out that a CIA drone and another, um, like a, a communication support plane, we'll call it, had also um, aerial footage of that area in it. They actually videotaped the whole battle. And it's the first, I believe, the first battle ever recorded of that, that recorded uh, Congressional Medal of Honor recipients in action. And had it not been for that drone footage making itself known and the hard work that it took from John Chapman's family and others to get that um, that video footage to where it could be um, viewed and used as evidence, we would never have known the crime of cover of corruption that occurred that day. Well, after that day, when the story became that Brit Slabinski was the hero who did X, Y, and Z, and John Chapman was just some Air Force guy on a plane on a helicopter with SEAL Team Six. Um, that's just not what happened. Sadly, Brits Lubinsky was given a Congressional Medal of Honor prior to John Chapman, I believe, in order to get ahead of the story. If you read his, um, the citation, the words that are written on his Congressional Medal of Honor award, it reads eerily similar to what John Chapman did. Thank God, John Chapman actually earned two Congressional Medals of Honor that day and was awarded his after Brits Lubinsky. And the story, the true story came out. There was never any apology from the Navy. There was never any apology from Brit Slobinski or Tim Samansky or anyone else that day. And no one ever came forth and said, the story that, that happened that we're telling you is not how it actually happened. Um, and that's sad to me. They didn't own their shit. A matter of fact, they tried to continue to double down on it. And while I am, am not, um, a Navy SEAL historian. I do believe that at some, you know, I always try to use pop culture as a reference. You know, Happy Days was a great show until Fonzie jumped the shark, right? I believe this was when the Navy SEALs jumped the shark. They went from being the quiet professionals to realizing that they could, they can sculpt narratives based on whatever story they want to tell. Because if you have to remember, most of these missions are top secret. They shouldn't be public knowledge. What you do on these missions shouldn't be 
in movies and books. And your training shouldn't be taught to average citizens as a way to make money. That's not how this should work. This should be our special operators should be doing special operator shit and keeping their mouth shut because that's what they do. That's what they're trained to do. They're not glory guys. If you want to be glory guy, you go and you do regular army or Marines and you want to oorah and do all that stuff. Great. If you want to be a special operator, you got to know that the, the work that you do, no one will probably ever know about except for you and the guys that are there with you. That's what the job should be. And what I saw after investigating both Job and then also um, listening to Lori and reading her book, Alone at Dawn, which is the factual evidence of what happened that day, a New York Times bestselling book, Alone at Dawn, I realized that there were patterns between one that happened 10 years apart, 2002 and 2012, that the narrative, the way that you can sculpt the story was identical. And the people that were involved in 2002 in the sculpting of the story were also involved in 2012 in the sculpting of the story. And after speaking to dozens of Navy SEALs and, and support members, they confirmed to me how it's done, how the patterning is, is exactly the way that I saw it and why they can't come forward and talk about this. Because all I want, I want them to come forward. Like I, to me, it's very simple. If there's wrong happening, you come forward and you talk about it. Sadly, that's just not how it works. That's not what's, what's happening for many reasons. But number one, so there's, I was in a, a very similar, not, not some, I believe the United States Federal Air Marshal Service when I worked there was, was comprised of elite people. The people that were hired to go to work every day to protect America from terrorism on airlines were the best of the best in the country. We had Navy SEALs. We had Delta Force guys. We had Delta Force trainers in each office training us. We were trained the same level which these guys were trained in the SEALs. Um, we just didn't do the same job. The people that I worked with, the people that I knew, there were special operators in both, whether they're Marine Force Recon or Navy SEALs or Army Special Forces or Delta Force. To a man in a privacy room where we're talking about our lives and, and things we've done and war story in it up, those stories will come out. But they're not writing books. They're not selling their story to a, a screenwriter for a movie. They're not um, manipulating or um, using their their skill set and the job that they did for their country to make money. If anything, they're using it to build and train newer guys to come and replace them and do the same type of thing for their country, for patriotism, for honor, duty, and country. And the Navy SEALs jumped the shark on March 4th, 2002, when they started the, the lie about what happened to John Chapman. And, you know, if you're a parent or even, and I've been a cop for as long as I have, almost 30 years, you got to understand criminal behavior and criminal mindsets. And, and sometimes you get criminals that get caught and then you have a chance to ask them, like, how did they get to where they are? Like, how did you, how did your life go from whatever it started as to where you are today? And oftentimes you get the story of, oh, I stole something. If you have a, a somebody who's a, a serial Somebody who steals all the time. It's because it was easy. They didn't, they didn't get caught that first time. And the rush that you get from doing that and not getting caught and getting away with it, that you slowly just become accustomed to the, the steal, to the lie, to the, to the rush of getting away with um, committing a crime. Same thing with drug addicts. You know, the, they say heroin is the, the worst drug to get addicted to because the, the best high you ever get from heroin is the first high. And then every high thereafter is trying to chase and replicate that first high. And that's why they get so addicted because that first high is just so amazing, apparently. Once you start lying and getting away with it, it becomes easier every single time you lie thereafter. 
And then when you can find a way to turn that lie into um, promotions, um, accolades, financial windfalls, fame, all of those things that come with greed, that's when um, that's when it becomes really, really evil. And the driver for that then becomes the greed. It started as easy as I lied and I got away with it and we needed to cover our asses to now it's a, it's a pre-planned coordinated process. It's like a, you know, I, I was in, in the franchising world for a little while. And the reason why franchise businesses work is because it's business in a box. Basically someone had perfected how to run that business and created a process so easy that anybody could replicate the way the first one was done. And that's kind of what's happened here within the SEALs. They created this, this process, this replicatable process throughout the teams over the last 20 years or so. And it's become pervasive within the teams. And if you just think about timing wise, most of this happened post 9-11. Um, a lot of things changed after 9-11. I know that for a fact. You know, the, the Patriot Act became uh, this whole, it's for our safety, but there were so many ways that the government, even to this day, has been manipulating the usage of the Patriot Act to, um, to achieve outcomes, both domestically and internationally. And I believe the war in Afghanistan and Iraq provided the best landscape for this type of behavior to take hold. And then the, Afghanistan is a land of mountains and dirt and people who are terrorized by the Taliban and other terror organizations within their, their borders. But it's also a land of much, much, much opportunity. Um, over the last, I don't even know exactly when, I'd say 10 years maybe, the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan went from a large mass operation of forces to a very small specialized operation of forces using mostly government contractors who were all prior special operations and current uh, Navy SEALs, special forces units, things like that. But the amount of money required still is the same. The, the the process of how corruption can be bred within any organization is usually through opportunity. And, you know, we always say uh, in the law enforcement world, it's, it's when you have opportunity, you have, you have a chance for, for criminality. So being able to show and, and see the patterns that I've been able to see through my interviews with people through my investigations into Job's death and into uh, what happened on Roberts Ridge, I began to see patterns in other instances that have occurred in, within the SEAL community, some very public, um, some that are less public, um, but the patterning is the same. And it scares me to think that A, it, it's able to happen right in front of everyone, God and country over there. Everybody that is on the teams knows about what's going on. They just can't talk about it. And, you know, there's, there are people who are high profile people who have been in, in the public, um, who became the face of the Navy SEALs. Some are still, some are no longer with us. Um, have questionable backgrounds within their own SEAL, you know, how, what they did as a SEAL. Um, I've, I've talked to people who've worked with a lot of these guys. And they were subpar what they did. They weren't the best of the best. They weren't running and gunning and setting the standard and the best at everything within their own team. And that's another pattern. You start to see the ones that are I don't want to say the fuck ups, but the ones that fuck up are the ones that end up rising to prominence. And it's almost sometimes in law enforcement, it's the same way. And, and I, I've seen it many, many times where someone rises to the level of, of high rank, whether it's a chief or a deputy chief or a captain or a lieutenant. And you look at their career and you go, how the hell did they get to that level? 
and and there's a there's a process to doing that. There's a process to not being good at your job, but still being elevated to positions of power within your own profession. And it's kind of what happened with with the the Navy SEALs I'm talking about, and I'm not going to name names because I don't want to be sued. They were not stellar so uh, SEALs. They were not stellar uh, anything other than um, having a a less than moral code while doing their job, and a less than moral code when allowing the SEAL brand, which it is, it is now anybody, I, I dare anybody to, to, to prove me wrong, but the SEAL, SEAL name is actually a brand now. There are so many people out there that are ex-SEALs who are using the Trident and the Navy SEAL name and their time in the SEALs to make money doing something, whether it's as a speaker or as a podcast host or as a TV show or uh, making movies, writing a book. Um, selling a product that really has zero value. Somehow, they're all successful in every one of their ventures. Navy SEAL post, post-service post time, their financial windfall goes from here making military money to here making brand association money. And by brand association money, I mean how they are able to take their time in the SEALs and manipulate that and maximize that value and associate themselves with the Navy SEALs to make money doing something talking about what they did with the Navy SEALs or branding, literally branding what they're selling with the SEAL brand. And that can't be done unless you have participation with the Navy. The Navy has to allow for that to happen. Um, I'm sure it's part of their recruitment process. That, that At least that's what I would, if I was trying to cover up possible corruption, I would say oh, we're using it for, for recruitment. We're trying to get people to be aware of what we do and our recruitment numbers are down or whatever, whatever the storyline becomes. And it's just, again, another, for me, my opinion, another fabrication because it's really not what they're doing. They're not simply just um, recruiting and, and, and highlighting the very best of the very best. Um, speaking to people that knew these people that are now the face of or were the face of the Navy SEALs it's just simply not true. They weren't, they wouldn't be, their, their training and service records would not on its truth and face value make them the ones that you would want recruiting. It just wouldn't. Um, and for me, when I, when I look at our world today and how corrupt things are within our own government, the question I asked myself early on is how could this happen how could it just be allowed to, to exist and persist for as long as it has? Sometimes there are anomalies. I guarantee you, I'd, when I was in the military, we had corruption. Uh, I know I was in intelligence. We had a guy that was arrested and charged with espionage for stealing classified documents and selling them to who he believed to be was, a, uh, I believe he was an East German um, spy for Russia or the USSR back then. So I know it exists, but it's usually a one-off. It's usually maybe a couple. It's not It's not a systemic, uh, repeatable pattern over the course of two decades. And it's only gotten bigger and grown. Um, the Navy SEAL brand, you know, ask yourself, when did you start to become aware of the inner workings, the details of what SEALs do? Think of every famous movie that's out there with a the SEAL talking about a famous mission after the fact why are they allowed to tell that story? Yes, I know we want to know. We want to, we're, we're humans. We, we're fascinated by the shit we don't know about or that we believe is, you know, the, the war hero kind of stuff. The world needs heroes. I just believe we need to put real heroes um, or, or at least acknowledge real heroes are the ones that probably aren't selling their soul to the, to, to the greed of fame and fortune. So I ask you, when did you first start hearing about Navy SEALs and, and their, their exploits. You know, there are now companies that are out, whether it's online videos or books, series, or um, in-person training opportunities to learn from Navy SEALs as a civilian and learn techniques and tactics that I know for a fact are actual techniques and tactics. To me, that's scary. The fact that we're putting out there 
in the private sector for large amounts of money, people pay a lot to get this training. A peek behind that curtain into how the SEALs do what they do. That's scary. The fact that some movies that have come out aren't necessarily factual, I don't think. I don't think they're actually how it happened. There are there are many, many famous SEAL accounts of heroicism. And again, I will go back and say, I believe anybody that purposely puts himself in a position where someone else is trying to kill them by, with a gun or, or whatever, and you go and battle that person, you're a fucking rock star. You're a hero. That's not what I'm questioning. What I'm questioning is, is when, when the dust settles and the after actions are done and the reviews are done, that honestly, what happened, that what happened is honestly assessed and the proper attribution for success and failure are given. And I prefer that they don't get announced to the world. I don't want to know everything about the Navy SEALs. We're in a world now where everybody thinks they have a right to know everything, and they don't. Trust me when I tell you, there's shit that you just don't want to know about. So why are none of these, these people I've spoken to willing to willing to talk? James said he knew of them in 85 or 86. And I bet you that's right around the Dick Marchenko book series, uh, SEAL Team 6. I forget what it was. That might have been the series. I can't remember exactly. But Dick Marchenko was like the first famous SEAL. Um, and I would argue he was um, just as corrupt as every one of, of the other ones. I don't, I, I don't know that specifically. But based on patterning, I would say that that's probably a fair assumption. Um, then again, you know, maybe he's the maybe he's the anomaly that that he was able to to talk about his times in the seals and and make some money at it. But he actually was everything he says he he was. I don't know. He's so far back in the lineage that it it really isn't. I can't really connect the current corruption to him. But he is the first, I believe. I mean, you look at Jesse Ventura. Jesse Ventura has been talking about how they treated him, how he was exiled from the seals. And everybody thought he was some kind of crazy wingnut conspiracy theorist. I can tell you there's a lot of truth to the stuff that Jesse was putting out there way back when. And, and I'd love to interview Jesse Ventura. So if anybody listening knows Jesse Ventura, I know he lives up in Minnesota. I had found an address for him and sent a letter. Um, never got a reply. But uh, yeah, I where there's smoke, there's always some fire. So back to my, my question. Why do you think the SEALs are not willing, the SEALs that are current and, and, and retired now, are not willing to come forward and then share their truth publicly uh, under oath and, and bring an end to this corruption? The answer is, is that it's multi-layered. Um, number one, you know, the brotherhood within the SEAL community is very strong, as it should be. And nobody wants to be somebody that um, is considered a rat or a whistleblower, especially not in a, in a community that is so small and so selective and so specialized you don't want to be that guy. That's number one. Number two, once that happens, many more will come out. Because once one is brave enough, the rest will have the bravery to do it. And the house of cards falls. But what also falls with it is the trust within the community of each other. So everyone will start looking at each other as a potential whistleblower or rat. And that will cause the performance ability of each unit to drastically fall apart. And we can't have that. And, you know, as with I, I've talked about, you know, my conspiracy theories with, with the deep state and all that kind of stuff in the past and other um, lives I do. And I believe there's there's a lot of factuality to that. And one of the reasons why you can't uncover all the truth about the, the corruption within our government is because it would literally destroy the world. And by that, I mean the the trust between countries, you know, if, if there's corruption here, there's corruption everywhere because they're all interlinked. Leaders in power are all interlinked. And if there's, I know one thing about pe desperate people is if they feel like they're going down, they're taking people with them. 
and the global leadership network would implode. And then global infrastructure of each country would implode and trade would stop and commerce would stop and the economy would, would crash. And so many things would happen if you exposed it all. So you got to do little by little. The problem with that is when you go little by little, you're not actually removing the corruption. You're not getting the cancer cured. So we're in like a quandary. And and for me, I, I battle between emotionally, I battle between the desire for truth and for exposing corruption with the greater good that the Navy SEAL community does in um, keeping America safe. And that's a tough battle for me because you, you're not sure exactly where that line is. Um, when I got into this, oh, before I say that, the other reason why the SEALs are not talking is because the, the, what the SEALs tend to do is get you as a SEAL into a compromising position and then use, they get you out of that compromising position and then use that as their leverage on you. And I know for certain there are several, many people that I've spoken to that have gotten into that situation and can't for risk of destroying their own life. And it's, it's a choice we all have to make in life sometimes is the greater good versus our own good for risking their own um, safety and security and their reputation and their family and all that. They won't come forward. And I respect that. I, I can't judge somebody for their where they are in that decision process. When I first started investigating all this stuff, and it's still to this day, and I say this with all confidence, that if I was just able to solve Job's murder, I would put put a cap on this, and never open it again, because it's it's a frustrating um, journey I've been on. It's a scary um, future for me because I, I know I'm putting myself in grave risk by talking about this stuff. Um, but I also know that I owe it to uh, a high school friend and we weren't best friends, Joe and I, we, I never went to his house and hung out or, you know, we saw each other at parties and um, we're in all the classes, same classes together, all four years of high school, but we weren't necessarily close. Um, but I respected him and I liked him. And I respected his career uh, immensely. And we, we both sort of took similar tracks in life in service. And uh, I think we both had mutual respect for one another. And I, I respect his father and I respect his sister um, immensely. And I would love to be able to bring peace and closure to them um, by getting the answers that they seek, which is the truth. And, and again, my professional opinion is Job did not commit suicide, and my professional opinion is that Job was murdered. I have a belief on who possibly could have done it, um, but I don't have any evidence, so I won't be putting that out there. That's what I'm working on. Um, but the family and myself, if the truth is Job committed suicide, I would just like you to show me how you came to that truth and have it be factual. Show me where the evidence is that got you to that, that result because the evidence that you you allowed me to see and the evidence that I know based on crime scene and, and ballistics and blood splattered um, potential and, and, and all the things that, that come with a, uh, a suicide through gunshot to the head weren't present. And until they become present and I can see that evidence, you can't convince me that that's how it happened. I use this analogy all the time. Crime scene investigation, solving a crime through crime scene investigation and interviews and everything that goes with it to solve a crime is like having um, in your brain, you have a thousand piece puzzle set that you believe this crime looked like. This is how it happened, what the crime scene looked like, why it happened the way it did, who did it, all that. It, it comes in like a thousand piece puzzle set. And when you start, you have puzzle pieces all over the place and you don't know if you have all thousand or not. 
what happened with Joe's case, Job's case, is that they they basically gave me 250 pieces and told me that it looked like the cover on the on the 1,000 piece box. And I'm like, that's impossible. You can't take these 250 and assert that it is that picture or prove that it is that picture. So I'm working with a 250 piece puzzle set that needs a thousand to complete it. So if they want to give me the other 750 pieces, I'd be more than happy to um, provide my professional opinion on what the outcome is of that. And all I want and all I've ever wanted is for the United States Navy to reopen the investigation based solely on the known facts. And the known facts are, is that, and just think about this, and, and you may not be a cop and have no knowledge of crime scene investigation, but if I told you someone in your family was murdered in your house and I show up as the investigator and I do a quick look and I say, yep, that person's dead. We got to do an investigation. You would expect me to stay there and secure that so that none of nothing that's inside that house can be tampered with. Nothing comes in, nothing goes out, nothing gets moved, nothing gets shifted, nothing gets wiped down, nothing gets cleaned off. What happened in Job's case is he was found dead, NCIS showed up. They said, we'll be back later. Gave the key to Job's room, locked the door, gave the key to Job's room to a senior master chief and said, don't let anybody in here, okay? And they came back eight or nine hours later and started processing the crime scene. Well, Job had now been dead for close to 24 hours. That's unthinkable in the world of, of law enforcement and crime scene investigation for that to happen. The fact that they allowed for eight or nine hours unknown people potentially to go in and manipulate evidence to clean, to wipe, to shift, to move, to set up, to stage. The fact that that, and I'm, I'm not saying it happened. I'm just saying that's truly what could have happened because no one will ever know the wiser. Then they come back and they do the crime scene investigation. And then somehow photographs, which are vital to determining whether or not somebody committed suicide, vital, were lost on a disc and no digital copy exists. Those photos were the backsplash, the, the blood backsplash patterning on the wall behind where the gun would have fired from. That's very important because the splatter tells a story. It tells the angle, it tells the um, distance from someone's head where the, the, the bullet penetrated. There's a lot of things that can come from that. It can also show if there is no blood splatter or maybe a blood splatter with a blank spot in the center, that maybe somebody was sitting behind Job and he was shot in the head by that person. I don't know. That evidence doesn't exist. So those are things that when you're looking at, at making that puzzle picture look like the puzzle picture, if you don't have those pieces, you can't come to the conclusion that they came to. You just can't. And those are facts. I have his book right here. This is his, his murder book or suicide book, whatever you want to call it. This, I was, this is everything I had to study in order to become super tight and knowledgeable about Job's investigation. Um, all I want is the truth. I want Job's murder. I want the person who did it. I want to know. I want to know why no one, no one was disciplined or demoted or charged or investigated or anything for their ineptitude, whether it was the NCIS or the SEALs who, and, and this is another thing that just blows my mind. For those of you that, that watch NCIS or uh, CSI back in the day or any criminal um, law enforcement type show, you know that they do ballistic testing on guns. And one of the things they look for to find out if someone recently shot a gun is they do GSR testing, gunshot residue testing. And had um, Job shot himself, he would have GSR in his hand. So NCIS, you know, nine hours after establishing a crime scene and then leaving it on 
untouched um, or, or un unsecured, I should say, they came back and as part of their process in the crime scene, they bagged Job's hands. So they secured them as evidence. Basically, his hands became evidence and they taped them shut. And in order to obtain um, you know, any type of DNA forensic evidence that might be on his hands, including gunshot residue. Once the scene was released, um, the corpsmen, the people in the medical part of the unit, came and retrieved, retrieved Joe's body in order to prepare him to be shipped home for an autopsy. According to NCIS, the instructions were to not touch his body, meaning don't do anything to tamper with it, leave him just how he is, bag him that way, and send him home. Unfortunately, um, what they found out was that the SEALs, along with the medical people, had decided to wash Job's body when it got to the medical tent to remove the bags from his hands and wash his entire body, thus removing any forensic evidence from his body, and then rebag his hands with different bags and different tape. No one was questioned about that. No one was held accountable for that. That is beyond my own rec understanding of how anyone in that type of situation, how, how do you not ask that question of your people if you're a leader and go, what in the fuck were you thinking doing that? It, it goes against every tenant of crime scene investigation, every tenant of um, integrity of, of evidence, every tenant of law enforcement investigative skills. Every tenant of just right moral stuff. And nobody got held accountable for that. That screams cover up to me. That screams corruption to me. The fact that all of these fuck ups happened and no one was held accountable. Same thing with Roberts Ridge. Lies were told, fabricated stories. The facts were altered. For 15 years. And Brit Slabinski's penalty for lying for that period of time was a Congressional Medal of Honor. That's another pattern that from that day I've seen in many other cases where <laughs> people were actually promoted while in prison on murder charges as SEALs. Promoted. People who were subpar SEALs were pushed out of the Navy and then somehow became brand ambassadors, essentially, for the United States Navy SEAL brand. The patterning exists. And where there's one, there's multiple. And where there's multiple, there's a pattern. And where there's a pattern, you can show corruption. And all I want, though, and I've told this to many people, and you know, I get some people who are inquiring minds who were current SEALs who have come at me and wanted me to be quiet and leave this alone on behalf of people within leadership in the SEALs. Um, why do you care what I have to say if it's not true? But if you want me to go away, if you want me to stop, you want me to leave things well enough alone, all I ask is that the truth about Joe Price be known that if we're going for the greater good of the Navy SEALs, and if the other, if there's option A is you give me the person who killed Joe Price, or option B is we tear the roof off of it and see what happens, I would prefer A. I prefer you give me the one, I go away, and I solve my problem, which is trying to create closure for one family who deserves it. And for a, a friend of mine who served his country, country gallantly, to be treated with the respect and dignity and honor that he deserves, not as a, um, an example of how the pressure gets to you and you just have to take your own life because that's a bunch of bullshit. I want that versus this because I know this removes your ability to do your job and it takes away the security of our nation because you can't do the great things that you know how to do as special operations units within the SEAL community to go out and do that. 
I handcuff you. I basically neuter you by doing that. All I want is Job's death properly investigated. And if I'm wrong about it being a murder, prove it to me. Show me all the thousand pieces of that puzzle. Don't withhold factual evidence that is required to make a proper deduction of what happened that, that fateful night on December 22nd, 2012 in Tarancote, Afghanistan. Job deserves that. And for every SEAL that's out there that's listening to this, I am not slamming you. What I'm asking you to do is take a hard look in the mirror and ask yourself, is any of the stuff that I've been talking about happening in your unit? And if it is, are you willing to speak out and be a hero and stop it from, from becoming another black eye on America and especially within American military system. For those of you, if God forbid anybody that's super famous that knows, um, super famous SEALs that knows what I'm talking about and knows that I'm actually talking about them without saying their name, I want you to look in the mirror and ask yourself, how did I get here? How did I allow what was once my dream to help America become, I all I care about is me. Because for me, that's important too. Um, we are living in a world soon where things, the truth will be told um, on many different fronts. And I try to always stay as, when I'm talking about conspiracy theories and stuff, I say that, I, I lead with that, that these are theories, these are opinions. Um, but when it comes to this, these are facts. The things I discussed today are facts. Job's death are all based on facts that I just laid out. Roberts Ridge and John Chapman and, and Britt Slabinski and Tim Samansky's involvement in the covering up of what truly happened that day, those are, that's factual information that's been proven. And all I'm saying is between 2002 and 2020, and most specifically 2012, when Job was killed, there is enough patterning for me to go, these aren't isolated. This is happening a lot, way more frequently than any of us would ever stand for. And we have to find a way to stop it without blowing the entire thing up and neutering a, a group of people who have a very special mission to keep America safe. So that's what this show was about. I had to get this off my chest. It's been weighing on me for a couple of days. I always worry about doing these kinds of shows because it doesn't necessarily bring a warm fuzzy. You know, I serve my country in the military. I love my country. I would do anything for my country. Um, but there is a line between patriotism and doing, doing hard jobs in hard places under ungodly circumstances to um, being a corrupt individual doing evil things and knowingly doing them and thinking it's okay. That's kind of where we are, where we have to draw that line in the sand. And I ask anybody who is thinking about joining the Navy SEAL to ask yourself, are you willing to put yourself in that situation? And remember, when you're working in a team and you're working in a, in a shit show and you're on an op and shit goes sideways, sometimes it goes sideways past that line. And then if you participated in that, you were now complicit, even if you didn't intentionally do so. And that... I believe maybe one of the ways they control people from not saying anything. And I've heard of those things in, from other people. That's kind of how they do it. And uh, if you're currently a SEAL and you're in those situations and you want to get out, um, all I ask is that you, you exit. If you're not going to exit and talk, exit and be silent. Be a silent professional. Don't take the lure of fame and fortune because they do it for everyone. Everyone that's been, been compromised on some level ends up getting an opportunity for fame and fortune. It's how they continue to keep you ingratiated into the brand. All I'm asking you to do is, is go silently into that good night and don't share your stories. Don't manipulate your service and be the silent professional. And to those who may know about Job's death that might hear this podcast, I beg of you to contact me. If you want to email me, 
email, email me uh, some secure email, Matt Kubler at protonmail.com. Um, I will keep you as, as anonymous as you want to be. I don't need to share your information with anybody. I just need someone that can come forward and tell me I'm in the right, right place in my, in my investigation. So, um, I guess that's it folks. That's all I got for today. Um, so this was a great solo podcast for me. I got a lot off my chest and, uh, I truly do appreciate and, uh, and continue to, to, to be thankful for the fact that I have a platform to do this. All right, everybody. God bless. Oh, don't forget, if you want to learn more about my podcast, you can find it anywhere on the audio side, iTunes, Stitcher, Apple Cat, you name it. It's everywhere. My YouTube channel is Matt Kubler. Um, I'm here on haps.tv at Matt Kubler. Um, two dates in a dash on Twitter and on Instagram. And uh, if you want to learn more about me personally, you can go to my website, mattkubler.com, M-A-T-T-C-U-B-B-L-E-R.com. All right, everybody. God bless. Take care and go out and be kind to one another.